This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. Well, our scriptural lesson today is coming from the 22nd chapter of the book of Matthew, uh, verse 34 through 40 from the New King James Version of Scripture. Notice there these words. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So today we speak from the subject, the heart of the matter, the heart of the matter, the heart of the matter. Isn't it interesting here that some of the Pharisees were trying to catch Jesus by asking him a question. Now Jesus is the master teacher and he's a master communicator. And as a master communicator, it is not just hearing the question that is being asked, it's being able to hear the question that's not being asked. So Jesus understood the motive behind the question. He knew that they were trying to trap him. And saying, Master, which, which is the greatest of all of the commandments? You have to understand in Jewish law, in the Old Testament, the Old Testament has probably uh, 600 plus laws, 630 laws. That, that's tons of laws in the Old Testament uh, about everything, about wearing blended fabric. I mean, they had so many laws, dietary laws. They had all kinds of laws. Uh, I mean, it's, you know, once we got the, the, the Ten Commandments, that's just, that's just one little set. But the Jews had over 600 laws to keep. So now here this pharisaical attorney whose profession is to make people look stupid by asking them questions comes to the great Rabboni himself, the great rabbi, the great teacher, and tries to trap him with a question. But Jesus understands the motive behind the question that they're asking. And it's a good question, though. He says, hey, hey you know, we got 600 plus laws. So here's the attorney saying, which one is the great commandment? In other words, he's asking, which one is the greatest out of all of those, if you had to boil all of these 600 plus laws down to just one, which is the most critical one? And without stammering and without stuttering and without saying, uh, uh, and uh, let me see, and uh, could you repeat the question and, and uh, can you spell that for me and give me the origin of it? Jesus takes this time and without flinching, speaks that the greatest is to love God with all of your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. To love God with everything. Uh, one of the things about life is that when life produces a crisis, whenever you come in a crisis, uh, your priorities become very clear very quickly whenever you're in a crisis. If you don't really know what you value, get in a pickle. And your priorities and what you value will become very, very clear. Uh, if, if you're really struggling right now, just, just think about this. If your house were set on fire, you wake up in the middle of the night and your house is in flames and smoke is billowing in to the room where you are. 
and you know you need to get out. And you have the opportunity to take one thing with you. What is that one thing? When you're in a fire, now you don't have time to go through an inventory of everything that's in your closet and try to figure out whether you should grab your phone or your computer or your purse or your wallet. But I tell you this, the fire, the crisis of the fire will force you really quickly to say you need to get out. We have a place over in Alabama and it caught on fire and an uh, elderly gentleman was in there and they had to get everybody out of the building. And he's sitting out in a wheelchair naked because he had to get out. It, it wasn't even important for him to get a towel. He was just trying to save his life. So he said, forget all of that stuff that's in the He's out, dude is outside with the place in flames, naked in a wheelchair, but he's out. And, and I guess he said, I can get some more clothes and some more socks and shoes and underwear and robe and pajamas. And I get all of that. But what I can't get enough, another is if I lose this. So whenever you get in a, in a situation where your house is on fire, it helps you to see with great clarity what your priorities are. So this is the way that the attorney is phrasing the question to Jesus. That Jesus, if you got a house of laws, and, and if you couldn't take but one of them, I mean, which one are you going to come out with? Which one are you going to come out with? I mean, I, I, I wonder myself, which one would I, would I come out with? And so, thank God Jesus gave us the answer because there are different things that mean different things to different people. But Jesus goes to the heart of the matter and talks about the love toward God. Because if you don't have love toward God right, everything else is going to go left. If you don't have love toward God right. And see, the scriptural writers said that whoever says that they love God and they don't know how to love their brother, or their sister, is a liar. I didn't say that. The scriptures says that. And that's why people come off as terribly hypocritical and sanctimonious when they are in the in the church, they're, they're worshiping God and always praising, and yet they can't get along with other human beings that they know. That's, that's the issue because that's the supreme thing, that if you love God, walking in proper love and fellowship with God sets the agenda, sets the tone. It frames the worldview by which you should operate all of your relationship. That's why it's the way of the cross is getting the vertical relationship right with God, my heart right with God in proper alignment as it is on, in heaven, so let it be on earth. That's what Jesus taught us to pray so that let what's up there come down here. Let's get a vertical part of this, but let's not just have a vertical axis. Let's also have the horizontal one so that we create the cross and that when you get this right love the Lord your God with all of your heart your mind your soul and your strength in vertical uh, alignment with God now he says and the second one is like unto this love your neighbor outwardly to your left to your right to your front to your back love your neighbor as you love yourself and he built in that a triple threefold cord because you can't love them if you don't know how to love this. And if you ever see somebody disrespecting somebody else, it's because they don't love them themselves. When you know how to love yourself, you know how to love others. When you know how to respect yourself, you know how to respect others. And so whenever you see people with a disrespectful uh, attitude, they, it's a manifestation of how they feel concerning themselves. And so... Loving God, I want you to understand, is not a new concept. Jesus wasn't teaching them something brand new. Loving God is not a new concept. It's an Old Testament concept, an Old Testament principle. Look at it, where the, the, the Moses gave it in the law, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Notice this, verse 4 through 7. Hear, O Israel. I've always wanted to do that. <laughs> the Lord our God. The Lord is one. 
You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Isn't that the same words that Jesus just told the lawyer? He got that from Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5. That's where he got it. And he says, and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. He said, let's go to the heart of the matter. The words that I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach these words, them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. Teach your children, your family to love God with all of their heart, their mind, their soul, their strength. All of the other problems are a problem of love. When you love properly, you don't commit adultery. When you love problem, you don't lie. When you love all of them, if you can look at all of the other, that's why he says on these commandments, these two about loving God and loving your neighbor as you love yourself. If you get these two right, he says, everything else is built into these. That's going to the heart of the matter. This is the hub and everything else are just spokes that are coming out from the hub. That if you get the heart of it right, if a person's heart is right, you can work with them. If their heart is not right, there's nothing you can do with them. You, I don't care, you can educate them, but if, if they got a rotten heart and an educated mind, you have educated evil. So it, it's about getting the heart right, going to the heart of the matter. I don't care what their resume looks like, where they've been to school, how many degrees they have, and where they have worked, and what they have accomplished here, there, and the other. But if their heart is not right, the question is, if I get into bed with you, can I trust you? If I come into a business deal with you, can I trust you? Can I trust you? The greatest compliment is not merely to be loved, it's to be trusted. Can I trust you? Can I trust you? Not can I love you, can I trust you? But when you love with your everything, and you can tell when people love you in an unpretentious way, in a way that is genuine, when people love you genuinely, it allows you to be able to trust them. Real love is always able to be trusted. Real love is always able to be trusted. Worship has been defined as love responding to love. Love responding to love. We love God because he first loved us. He looked at us and winked at us and said, you know what, you're the apple of my eye, I like you. I really love you, I created you in my image. And God says, I love you. I love you unconditionally. I don't care what you do to me. God says, I'm going to love you. And he says, there's nothing, absolutely nothing that you can do that's ever going to affect my love for you. Even if you disobey my voice, I'm going to love you. Even if you lose your temper and say something that is off kelter, he said, I'm still going to love you. Even if you go out and do the very thing that I told you not to do, he said, he said you're still mine. Even if you go a whoring after other gods, he says, you're still mine. He said, I'm married to you. I am married. He said, we're in this together. He said, I'm in this by covenant. And, and my love for you is not based on your perfection. It is based on who I am because God is love. And we have the great privilege of being the benefactor, the object of God's love. We're the benefactors of his love. And uh, in, in the Hebrew scriptures, you actually see the word heart. Uh, as, as the seat of the mind. It is the seat of the will. It is the seat of the emotions. So when you talk about the heart, you're not talking about the muscle that pumps blood through the body. You're talking about loving God with, with your mind, the seat of your mind, loving him with your will, loving him with your emotions, loving him with your body, loving him with everything that you've got, every fiber of your being. And so God loves passionate worship that flows out of the heart. Remember this now, the word passion actually means pain or suffering. Passion, it means pain or suffering. Uh, the word passion and path, P-A-T-H, have very similar roots. The word path, P-A-T-H, uh, is a suffix that means suffering from 
You've ever heard of a pathologist? They study the diseases that human beings suffer from. A person dies, you bring in the pathologist, they analyze tissue, they're looking at it and say that this person was suffering with cancer, this person was suffering with this, they died of this. They tell you what we are suffering with, that's pathology. It has to do with the path, with the same root of your passion. And uh, there is a link between passion and between sacrifice. Because Jesus had a passionate love for his people. He had a passionate love for us as the bride. He died for the church. He gave his life willingly because he was passionately in love with us. Passionate and sacrifice. He became the ultimate sacrifice. There is a connection between passion and sacrifice. The word sacrifice, it comes from a, a, a Latin word sacra, which means sacred and fice, which means to perform. Sacrifice means to perform the sacred, to perform the sacred. It's connected to passion, which means pain. When we think of passion, oftentimes we think of it in the romantic sense of, of a deep love. A certain so-and-so has great passion. Oh, he's such a passionate kisser. She's such a passionate kisser. We think of, of deep love, strong love. But passion actually means pain. When a person is passionate, it means that they are willing to suffer for what they love. Are you listening? So if a mother is passionate for her children, she will suffer for her children. If she's passionate for her husband. If a man is passionate for his wife, they lay down their life, they're willing to suffer, they'll take a bullet for you. They'll get up when they don't feel like getting up and fix breakfast. When they don't feel like it because it's suffering for what you love. If you're passionate about music, you'll give up your social time to practice your instrument. Whether it is your voice, whether it's something that you play, a horn, whatever it is. When you're passionate about something, if you're passionate about acting, you'll practice it when nobody is paying you. You do some free gigs. You do it because of your passion. If you love it, nobody has to pay you to do it. You do it because you're passionate about it. The first three years that I was in the ministry, I never accepted a dime. I'd go places and speak. They'd give me an honorarium, and I'd get home, and I'd send it back. The whole thing for three years. You know why? I'm not in it for the income. I'm in it for the outcome. It was my passion. I was arrested by him, the one that loved me with an incalculable, inestimable love. And I'm just, just being in love with him. Caused me to say, God, I'm not in this for the money. I'm in this not for the income. I'm in it for the, the outcome. I want to see people's lives affected for your glory. For your glory, Lord. It's my desire. It's my desire. When you do things with the right reason, it'll make you study, suffer because of what you love. It made me study when I didn't feel like studying. It made me pray when I didn't feel like praying. I'm just telling you, if you got a passion for something, I, I, it bothers me when people tell me that they're passionate about something and then you see no effort on their part. You, they're just sitting around acting as though you can use some flimsy universal law of attraction. A law of attraction means nothing without a law of action. Are you listening? The law of attraction means nothing without the law of action. You've got to do something. Your passion will cause you to suffer for what you love. If you love somebody, you'll do things that are uncomfortable because you love them. Because parents love their children, it'll make them work two jobs to help educate them, to help feed them, to help keep a roof over their head. It'll make them try to suffer to, so that you give them an advantage in life. They're, they're doing it not because somebody made them do it. They're doing it because the passion drives you to doing it. My question to you today is, are you willing to suffer or to sacrifice for what you love? Sometimes it might mean the sacrifice of your pride. It might mean the sacrifice of comfort. It might mean the sacrifice of security. It might mean the sacrifice of sleep. It may mean the sacrifice of some of your social time. Are you willing to suffer for what you love? That's what real passion for God is about, is suffering for what you love. Experiencing a pain or discomfort for what you love. 
for what you love. I love something that James Allen said. He says, there can be no progress, no achievement without sacrifice. And a man's worldly success will be the measure that he sacrifices. If you're going to do anything great, you got you to sacrifice for it. You got to sacrifice. Even people that are in the underworld, these dudes are hustlers. I mean, folk that'll, that'll steal your music and, and sell it out of the back of their car, they, they're hustling. The dope pedal, they, they, you, you hustle, you get out there, you hustling. You're taking territory. It may be corrupt business, but you're still hustling. You get up early, you stay up late. These dudes be up into the wee hours of the night, hustling, thieves, hustling. They, they're working their hustle. Remember, it's not the law of attraction, it's the law of of action. It's the law of action. The law of action. Just remember, sacrifice is not a dirty word. Sacrifice is giving up something good in order to get something better. Sacrifice gives up something good that in return grants us something that is better. Sacrifice gives up something that is good in order that it will grant us something that will better. If you sacrifice here, it's going to grant you something better down the road. If you give up your sleep that is good, it's going to grant you a reward materially, financially, you know, in terms of, of a sense of a purpose and accomplishment. If you give it up, sacrifice, 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 giving up something good that grants you something better. It's giving up something good that grants you something better. When Jesus talked about the fact that except you give up your life, you're going to lose it. But if you're willing to give it up, he said, that's when you'll gain it. Another version says it this way. When you give up the lower life, you get the higher life. And so you have to be willing to give up the lower life in order to get the higher life. Sacrifice is giving up something good in order that it will grant you something better. It grants you something better. So when Jesus was asked, which is the greatest law of all of the commandments. He just immediately went to clarity that if I had to take one out of all of these hand bag full of laws, I'd go to the one on love. You know why? Because our love drives our behavior. Our love drives our behavior. Our love drives our behavior. You ever see people that have been manipulated by people that they love? It's because their love drives their behavior. If you love a certain sport, if you love basketball, if you love baseball, if you love hockey, if you love soccer, whatever you love, love drives your behavior. If you love talking to your friends or on social media, love drives your behavior. Whatever you love drives your behavior. If you love the Word of God, if you love prayer, love drives your behavior. Love drives your behavior. Uh, St. Augustine put it this way. He said, we are what we love. St. Augustine said, we are what we love. That's why the Bible says, Jesus said, love God with all of your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength because we are what we love. We are what we love. T. Harv Ecker said that you are made in the image of what you love. You are made in the image of whatever you love. If people fall in love through addiction with methamphetamines, they are made into his image. Their teeth begin to fall out. They are made into the image of whatever they love. When you find, fall in love with something that is evil and demonic, that evil will eventually come out in your face. Because you are made in the image of whatever it is that you love. And then I want you to understand this principle that you will never fully abandon what you still love and you will never fully pursue what you don't love with your entire being. I want you to get that very carefully. You will never fully abandon what you still love. You never fully abandon. That's why folks keep on dibbling and dabbling with their ex. Because they still get, you know, because yeah, yeah. they get lonely. Listen, don't drink poison just because you get thirsty. You know he poisoned. You know she's poisoned. I know you're thirsty, but don't drink. 
poison because you're thirsty. Don't drink poison because you're thirsty. But you'll never fully abandon. You wonder why, why she keep going back to him? Because she hadn't gotten him out of her system. And you can't leave what you still love. That's why I'm, when, when you really get delivered from sin, you can't still like it. You have to start abhorring it. You, you, when you see him, like, I know you're good looking, but you ain't nothing but trouble. You ain't nothing but trouble. And see, what happens is that when you get a few weeks and a few months down the road, uh, the pain of what they put you through begins to diminish and they may not have changed and you get thirsty and you pick up your digital device and contact them. What you doing? They know how to smell thirsty folks. And they know when you've opened the door to come in and do it all over again, making you think that they're going to love you again. And then they hit it. This is grown folks' church here, isn't it? I... Love is a complicated thing, isn't it? It's a complicated thing. But remember, you don't, you don't abandon what you still love. You don't abandon what you still love. But here's, here's the great dilemma. Is that we don't change by sheer determination. Some people think that if you've got enough willpower, you can just stop it. You, you, you can't just stop everything just by sheer willpower. Ask a drug addict. Ask an alcoholic. Ask a sex addict. You can't just quit certain things by sheer determination. Uh, it won't just disappear because you will it away. You can't just will it away. Uh, it, it comes down to what you love. It does. It comes down to what you love. And, and it's not about exposing the worthlessness of an old affection that you have for somebody or for something. Uh, it, it's uh, because people will still love somebody that they know is not good for them. They'll still love them. So it's not about exposing their unworthiness. Uh, there are people that are addicted to smoking. And they see the, the Surgeon General's warning on every pack that this may be harmful to your health. It has been found to cause cancer. And even the Surgeon General's warning about the cancer-causing potential of the cancer sticks doesn't deter them from smoking because they love what it feels like to take a drag of their cigarette. You don't leave what you, what you love, and you can't just use sheer willpower to get rid of it. Old man Tommy was a, a smoker all of his life since he was maybe 14 years old. And he's been smoking for 50 years. And his wife had been on him. You know, I can't stand that cigarette smoke, and he's blowing it in her face, still smoking. Still, nobody could get him to stop. His mama asked him, his daddy asked him, uh, his doctor told him, all of your numbers would go down, you'd be better, your heart rate, everything would be better in, in, in your life if you'd quit smoking. And, and he couldn't quit smoking because he loved how it made him feel. And he couldn't stop until one day, his little granddaughter climbed up on his lap. And she took her granddaddy's face and put it in between her little hands. And she said, Grandpa, I want you to start smoking so you can be alive to come to my wedding. And something about that, looking into the innocence of that child's life whom he adored. She had strings to his heart. And even when his mama and his daddy couldn't get him to stop smoking. And when his wife couldn't get him to stop smoking. But something 
about his six-year-old granddaughter putting her hands on his cheeks and looking into his eyes and saying, Grandpa, I want you to come to my wedding when I get grown caused him to never pick up another cigarette because he deemed something that he loved greater than his old flame. And that's how you actually end up conquering it. You see, it comes down to what you love. At the end of the day, we must replace old idols with something new that we love more. You replace old Id idols with something new that you love more, the love of God. Because here's the principle. What cannot be destroyed can be dispossessed. If you can't destroy it, dispossess it by getting a greater one in its place. Because if a woman has been in a relationship with an abusive man, and she's love hungry, she's not emotionally healthy, so she keeps going back to an abuser just so that she can feel needed and worthy and loved and happy for a few moments, even if it's pretentious. But it's because something is not well emotionally for her, so it causes her to gravitate to that kind of behavior. But if she ever meets the right one who knows how to love her properly, and he begins to love her unconditionally and affirm her and celebrate her. It will just be a matter of time that she won't be thinking about old Willie anymore because she's got something greater than the old flame. Why would you go back to an old broken down car that you had to put oil in it every time you filled it up? And you got a new car. I'm, I don't know about you. But to drive a car and to have to keep one foot on the gas and one foot on the brake when you come to a stop sign because you don't want the car to choke off and be embarrassed. And you get a new car that you don't have to deal with that anymore. Do you think that I would ever long to go back to that? I've been there. The way I had to park on a hill and drive down the street and pop the clutch to get the car started. And do you think that when I got a car that I didn't have to do that anymore that I ever long to go back to that? Absolutely not. And God is the preeminent love. It's about replacing the old love with a greater love. You're talking about the greatest love of all? When you put something in your future that is greater than the pain of your past, then there's no looking back. You will not think twice about it when God blesses you with somebody that knows how to cherish you and love you and celebrate you and bring out the best in you. Are you listening? When they can bring out the absolute best in you, that begins to cause you to be able to dispossess what you couldn't get rid of before. Even Moses chose love over the lust for power and position. Notice in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24 through 26. It was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. The fleeting pleasures of sin. The fleeting pleasures pleasures of sin. He chose. He chose. Moses made a choice of something that he loved more over something that he loved less. He thought it was better to suffer. Suffer. There's that passion again. For the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt. For he was looking ahead to his great reward. When you put something greater in your future than the pain of your past, it's easy not to look back. Moses was born a Hebrew, but he was raised an Egyptian. But when God called him, his identity changed. And he changed from his pagan Egyptian background. 
But when your identity is established in anything except Jesus Christ, it becomes a form of idolatry. When your identity is formed in anything except Jesus Christ, it becomes a form of idolatry. Do you know why? It is because your behavior flows out of your identity. Your behavior flows out of your identity. My daddy, when he was at Morehouse, he was graduated proudly in the class of 1940. And he pledged the Omega Sapphire. He was a Q-Dog. He's out of their identity comes the whoo, comes the behavior. Identity follows behavior. But when you understand the difference between really loving and lusting something, love gives to others at the expense of self, lust seeks to get at the expense of others. It's not very difficult. And that's why you have to carefully guard your thoughts because your thoughts run your life. Proverbs 4.23 says, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Guard your heart, the heart of the matter. For you should love God with all of your heart, all of your heart, all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, all of your strength. One of the reasons that we have to guard it so it's because we only have so much room there. It's not about quantity, but it's about quality. It's not about how many, it's, it's about what kind. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 24 says that the man of too many friends, chosen indiscriminately, will be broken in pieces and come to ruin. But there is a true loving friend who is reliable and sticks closer than a brother. Notice. You can have too many friends chosen indiscriminately that can lead you to brokenness and pieces and you can come to ruin. You know why? It's because you don't merely attract what you want or what you need. You attract what you value. You attract what you value. You attract what you value. And in order to attract genuine friends, you have to value true friends. You have to value authenticity. After Simon Peter denied Jesus, Jesus didn't give him a lecture about denial. Jesus didn't give him a lecture about betrayal. Jesus didn't even make him promise that he would never ever do it again. Jesus just asked him a question about the depth of his love for him. St. John 21 15, notice this. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. And may I remind you of this truth. Hell is not a place for those that don't believe in Jesus because the devils believe and tremble. Notice what John, uh, James chapter 2 verse 19 says. You say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God, good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. So just to say that you have faith in God is not enough. The question is, he's asking us, do you love me? He didn't ask about Peter, about, Peter, what were you thinking about when they asked you, did you know me and you denied me? He didn't, he didn't even go there. He didn't go to the specificity of sin. He just asked the question, do you love me? Do you love me more than anything else? Did you love me with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength? Peter, do you love me? Jesus said more by the question than he could have by a lecture. Peter, do you love me? You know why? Because hell is not for those who don't have faith in Jesus. Hell is a place for those who do not love Jesus. The devil believes in Jesus. They know that he was the son of God and that he had miracle working power, but they didn't love him. There are people that have been blessed and fed by God's hand, but they don't love him. 
And that same Jesus that asked Peter, who denied him, when he was confronted with the question, aren't you one of those Jesus followers? Don't you, aren't you supposed to be with him? And he was denying Jesus. And Jesus didn't give him a lecture about his behavior. He just brought it down and said, you know what? Peter, son of John, do you, do you love me? Do you really love me with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, all of your strength? Do you love me? Have you made me the supreme object of your affection? That you don't love anything else on this earth more than you love me? Do you love me more than your safety? Do you love me more than your security? Do you love me more than your healing? Do you love me more than your prosperity? Do you love me? If we lose this house, this car, do you love me? If you lose your hair, do you love me? Do you love me? He came to the heart of the matter. Christianity is not a religion of convenience. It is one of sacrifice, one of testing, one of pain. But our passion for Jesus is our willingness to suffer for him because we love him. And when we become acquainted with him in the fellowship of his sufferings, then we can enjoy the glory of the resurrected Lord because God never ends on a negative. And in the midst of all that we have done and his commitment to loving us unconditionally, Jesus had already taught the principle in John 15 that if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And so when Peter had denied him in word, in action, in deed, Jesus just comes with a reaffirmation because Peter denied him three times and Jesus made him affirm his love for him three times. It's not a lecture, but it's just bringing him back to the heart of the matter, the most central and essential part. This is the most salient essence of the whole thing that we call the gospel. Jesus says, Peter, I know what you did back there. Let's forget about that. Do you love me right now? Do you love me? We can move on from here as long as I know you love me. Do you love me? And when you have the right kind of love, you can overcome any challenge, any adversity, any unfaithfulness. If you've got the love, the right kind of love for God in your heart, you can overcome any challenge. Love is supreme. Love conquers all. He says, do you love me? The Apostle Paul writing to the church at Galatia, chapter 5, Paul told us this, faith works by love. Faith works by love. And some people can't get their faith to work because they don't have a real love. Jesus just asks us the question that causes deep personal introspection. The simply says, Son of John, Simon, Peter, do you love me? And that's my question to you today. You come to the heart of the matter. It's not asking about what you've done this past week and what you've thought, whether you've sinned in word and deed and attitude. The real question that you ever give a response for for Jesus is do you love him? Not do you believe in him. Do you love him? Jesus says, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Because everything else that happens between us flows out of this love relationship. Don't ever let anything come between you and your love for him. What shall separate us, Paul said, writing to the church at Rome, from the love of God, 
Shall angels, shall height, shall depth, shall death? None of these things has the power to separate us. Shall persecution? Absolutely not. Shall sickness, shall being in dire straits and desperate for money? Absolutely not. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God. And he's just asking, do you love me? Not do you have faith in me. Do you love me? Faith works by love. Faith works by love. Faith works by love. Do you love me? That's Jesus' question for you to entertain today, to search your own heart, to search the word. Say, am I loving God and becoming a conduit of his love? The way that God sees his reflection in us is the way that we love other people. So when God loves others through you, he sees a reflection of himself. He's made us in his image. God is love. And he's made us in his image. So when he's looking in the earth to see his image, the way that he recognizes himself is that that looks like love to me. That looks just like me right there. That looks like me. It's time to get your mirror out and examine yourself. See what you look like. Are you a reflection of his love? Our world has become terribly mean-spirited, very cruel, very critical, very attacking, very judgmental, very quick to cancel someone else. And I believe God's looking down and says, that doesn't look like me at all. Very divided. Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal. God is saying, look, look, look. Hey, 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 where are you getting your example from? Look, look, look to me. And Jesus is, is looking at a world that's at war with each other. He said, get your eyes off of that stuff, that trivial stuff that passes and doesn't mean anything. He says, look at, look at me. Reflect who I am. I'm above the culture. I'm above the culture. I'm above the culture. Christianity is not a subculture of American culture. Christianity, true Christianity, is a counterculture. We don't do what they do. We're in love with God. We know better. We know better. We ought to be too busy to love, uh, to hate. Too busy loving to hate. Too busy loving to criticize and to attack and to tear others down and to war. Too busy. We're called as creatures of love, made in the image of God. The whole heart of the matter is not how many scriptures you know. You'll never impress your children, your family, your friends by your knowledge of the Word of God. You'll only impress them by manifesting the depths, the various depths of love that come from God to say, surely this person was like Jesus. It's because of how you loved, how you serve, how. It's about the how. It's about the how. It's about the how. It's not the excellence of your doctrine. It's how well did you love him. And Jesus is still asking the question. Just take Peter's name out and imagine his asking you, do you love me? Imagine him that whatever repetitive sin, because most people are not struggling with a whole bunch of different sins, it's just the main, it's one main thing that they keep on doing over and over. One main thing. And Jesus is putting his hands on our cheek and looking into our eyes and asking the question, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? I want you to be there at the wedding because he's coming back for a bride. I want you to be at my wedding. And he's saying, I want to marry you, but I've got to know, do you love me? Not what I can do for you. Do you love me? Even when you're hurting. Do you love me? Even when you're confused. Do you love me? Even when you're angry. Do you love me when you're fearful? Do you love me? He said, I want to marry you. Let's meet at the wedding.
but ask the question, do you love me is what Jesus is asking. And I don't know about you, but I'm resolved in my heart that I want to be his bride. A part of that remnant that comes out of the church that says, Lord, I love you with all of my heart, my mind, my soul, my strength. You can have this whole world, but give me Jesus. Lord, I love you with all of my heart. That's why people could lose everything and still be in love with Jesus. I've traveled to so many places in the world where they didn't have anything but Jesus. And they were the most happy and peaceful individuals. Didn't have material prosperity, but they had Jesus. And they had peace. And they had joy. And they were in love with him as though he had blessed them with the whole world and he had given them the world because he gave them himself and he has the world in his hands do you love him is your question for you to just entertain in your own time of personal reflection and time of prayer with him over the course of this week and let your answer be lived out in action. Let the law of action manifest the inward working of the heart. Iniquity is a matter of the heart. Transgression is a matter of the body. Iniquity is in the heart. Transgression is the outward manifestation that the body does to act out the iniquity that's in the heart. It's the difference between iniquity and transgression. Iniquity is motive, is intent, is the planning of the evil. It's the evil intent, but transgression is the act that carries it out. And while we've been focusing on transaction, transactions, he's focused on the matter of the heart, where what's driving you in your heart to do these actions. And he wants to get the heart of the matter correct. We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.